As we've already seen and discussed, we have four valves found in the heart. The design and the structures of these valves ensure that blood is pumped only in the forward direction, basically one way and one way only. Keep in mind that all four valves are lined with the endocardium. We have the right atrioventricular valve or right AV valve or tricuspid valve found between the right atrium and the right ventricle. It consists of three cusps or cuspids or valve flaps, hence the name tricuspid. The left atrioventricular valve, or left AV valve, or bicuspid valve, or mitral valve, found between the left atrium and the left ventricle. It consists of two cusps, or cuspids, or valve flaps, hence the name bicuspid. Both the left AV valve and the right AV valve have their valve flaps anchored or attached to the papillary muscles by these cords of collagen, the cordy tendini, that provide structural support to these valves. When we discuss how these valves function, we will see how the valve flaps, the cordy tendini, and the papillary muscles ensure the one-way direction of blood flow. Additional structural support are provided by the atrioventricular fibrous rings, or the AV fibrous rings, part of the fibrous skeleton of the heart, the cardiac skeleton. We have the right AV fibrous ring for the right AV valve, and the left AV fibrous ring for the left AV valve. We will discuss this further in the next slide. The valves found between the ventricles and the arteries, in which the blood is pumped into and the ventricles simultaneously contract, are the pulmonary semilunar valve or pulmonary valve, the valve found between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, and the aortic semilunar valve or aortic valve, the valve found between the left ventricle and the aorta. The design and shape of both these semilunar valves are identical, each with three cusps and supported by a fibrous ring. The aortic fibrous ring for the aortic valve and the pulmonary fibrous ring for the pulmonary valve. If we look at the heart from the superior view, we can see how each cusp is shaped like a cup or an upside down umbrella. Take note, there are no cordy tendini or papillary muscles associated with these semilunar valves. So if we go back to this slide that shows us the fibrous rings, we can see that we have these three C-shaped fibrous attachment sites. Each is where each cup-shaped cusp anchors to, providing the structural support to the three cusps of the semilunar valves. As you will see later, just like a cup that can be filled to hold fluid, each cup-shaped cusp can also be filled to hold fluid, the fluid being blood. No such C-shaped fibrous attachment sites are associated with the atrioventricular fibrous rings. Before we leave this slide, I'd like to point out additional structures or openings that we can see with these diagrams. We begin with the opening of the coronary sinus, located along the medial wall of the right atrium, just inferior to the fossa ovalis. This opening allows blood from the coronary sinus to drain into the right atrium. The coronary sinus is one of the coronary blood vessels blood vessels found in the wall of the heart. More on this later. We also have two openings of the coronary arteries found lateral to the aortic valve. We have an opening on the left side for the left coronary artery and an opening on the right side for the right coronary artery. These coronary arteries branch off of the proximal end or root of the aorta. As blood is ejected from the left ventricle, it enters the aorta, where some of the blood enters both the left and right coronary arteries through these openings. These coronary arteries, just like the coronary sinus, are also coronary blood vessels found in the wall of the heart. The last openings are found in the left atrium. We have four openings of the pulmonary veins, two on the left and two on the right. 
two openings on the left for the two left pulmonary veins that delivers blood from the left lung to the left atrium, and two openings on the right for the two right pulmonary veins that delivers blood from the right lung, also to the left atrium. We have two diagrams that illustrate the blood flow through the heart. For now, we will strictly focus on the direction of blood flow, the associated structures, and the concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide in blood. It is extremely important to memorize this basic concept, otherwise it will become confusing as we discuss more details later. We will consider blood flow into and out of the right side of the heart, then consider blood flow into and out of the left side of the heart. But remember, blood flow into the heart, both the right and left sides, occur at the same time, followed by blood flow out of the heart that also occurs at the same time from both the right and left sides. Furthermore, the color of the blood vessels indicate the concentration of oxygen and carbon dioxide in blood. Blue colored blood vessels carry blood that have a lower oxygen concentration and a higher carbon dioxide concentration. This is referred to as deoxygenated blood. Red colored blood vessels carry blood that have a higher oxygen concentration and a lower carbon dioxide concentration. This is referred to as oxygenated blood. Let us begin with the right side of the heart. Blood flows into the right atrium from three major veins, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. Both the superior and inferior vena cavae are considered great vessels of the heart. Take note that the blood carried by all three major veins is deoxygenated. Blood will then pass through the right atrioventricular valve or the right AV valve or the tricuspid valve as it moves from the right atrium into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, blood leaves the heart as it passes through the pulmonary semilunar valve or the pulmonary valve and enters the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk is a large artery and one of the great vessels of the heart. Take note of the color of the pulmonary trunk. It is a blue colored blood vessel, therefore the blood that passes through this large artery is deoxygenated. The pulmonary trunk splits into the right and left pulmonary arteries. These pulmonary arteries will further divide or branch to give us a total of four pulmonary arteries going to the lungs. The two right pulmonary arteries delivers deoxygenated blood to the right lung and the two left pulmonary arteries deliver deoxygenated blood to the left lung. At the lungs, gas exchange occurs which oxygenates the blood and returns to the heart by four pulmonary veins, two right pulmonary veins from the right lung and two left pulmonary veins from the left lung. These four pulmonary veins deliver oxygenated blood to the left atrium. Blood will then pass through the left atrioventricular valve or left AV valve or bicuspid valve or mitral valve as it passes from the left atrium into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, blood leaves the heart as it passes through the aortic semilunar valve or aortic valve and enters the aorta. The aorta is another large artery and one of the great vessels of the heart. Take note of the color of the aorta. It is a red colored blood vessel. Therefore, the blood that passes through this large artery is oxygenated. From the aorta, the oxygenated blood is distributed throughout the body, including the heart itself. This is a diagram I created showing the blood flow into and out of the heart. To hopefully make it easier to memorize the chambers of the heart, the valves of the heart, the blood vessels, and the direction of blood flow. Take note of the color of the arrows to indicate oxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood that travels through the blood vessels into and out of the heart. 
Before we move on to the next part of the anatomy of the heart, I'd like to discuss the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and briefly mention the aorta. Blood from structures above the diaphragm, including the upper limbs, will ultimately all drain into the large superior vena cava. Exceptions are blood from the wall of the heart and blood that is part of the pulmonary circulation. More on this later. Blood from all structures below the diaphragm, including the lower limbs, will ultimately all drain into the large inferior vena cava. Both the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava deliver the oxygenated blood into the right atrium. While blood from the wall of the heart drains into the coronary sinus, another vein, that also delivers the oxygenated blood into the right atrium. The aorta is one large artery that delivers oxygenated blood to the entire body from head to toe. The left and right coronary arteries directly branch off of the aorta. These arteries deliver oxygenated blood to the wall of the heart. We will look at the aorta again and discuss the major segments of the aorta later. The next slide is a practice worksheet. I'd suggest printing several copies and using it to help with memorization. The main function of the heart valves is to ensure the one-way flow of blood through the heart, always in the forward direction. These next two slides will focus on the operation of these four valves. We begin with the right and left atrioventricular valves. They both function the same way, in preventing blood from flowing back into the atria from the ventricles. The key structures in the operation of the AV valves are the valve flaps, the cordy tendini, and the papillary muscles. Remember that the surfaces of these structures are lined with the endocardium. The atrioventricular fibrous rings are thick rings of dense fibrous connective tissue that extend to form the sheet-like cusps of the AV valves. So the right atrioventricular fibrous ring extends to form the three cusps or cuspids or valve flaps of the right atrioventricular valve. And the left atrioventricular fibrous ring extends to form the two cusps or cuspids or valve flaps of the left atrioventricular valve. At the other end of the valve flaps are the cordy tendini. These cords of collagen extend from the valve flaps to anchor or attach to the papillary muscles. The result is a seamless fabric of dense fibrous connective tissue beginning from the atrioventricular fibrous ring to the valve flaps, while the collagen from the dense fibrous connective tissue continue on to form the cordy tendini. The cordy tendini can either be loose or tight, depending whether the papillary muscles are contracted or relaxed. When the papillary muscles contract, they pull on the cordy tendini, tightening the cordy tendini. And when the papillary muscles relax, they no longer pull on the cordy tendini, so the cordy tendini are now loose and have a lot of slack. What determines if the papillary muscles relax or if the papillary muscles contract? Well, it all has to do with the ventricles. When the ventricles contract, so do the papillary muscles. In fact, the papillary muscles contract just before the ventricles contract, tightening the cordy tendini. The contraction of the ventricles will increase the pressure in the ventricles. This pressure will result in the blood pushing up against the valve flaps as the blood attempts to go back into the atria. The reason for this will be discussed later. As blood pushes up against the valve flaps, each valve flap meets, closing off the opening. The atrioventricular valves are now closed. So it is essential that the papillary muscles contract to tighten the cordy tendini to prevent the valve flaps from flipping back or everting into the atria. Imagine an open umbrella and a strong gust of wind 
pushes the umbrella to where the umbrella flips backwards, inside out. Should this occur, blood will flow back into the atria. The back flow of blood is referred to as regurgitation. The force and pressure of the closure of these AV valves are strong enough to produce a sound, the lub heart sound, which is heard when using a stethoscope. As seen with these diagrams, the right and left AV valves are designed to accommodate the back pressure and backflow of blood, therefore preventing the blood from flowing back into the atria during ventricular contraction. Take note that the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves are open when the ventricles contract. We will discuss these semilunar valves in the next slide. Now, when the ventricles relax, so do the papillary muscles. The cordy tendini are now loose and have a lot of slack. As blood flows into the atria, it pushes these AV valves open and blood now freely flows into the ventricles. Take note that the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves are closed when the ventricles relax. The next pair of heart valves are the semilunar valves, the aortic semilunar valve or aortic valve and the pulmonary semilunar valve or pulmonary valve. They each have three cusps that are shaped like cups and function the same way in preventing blood from flowing back into the ventricles from the arteries. The cusps of the semilunar valves are extensions of the C-shape or U-shape fibrous attachment sites that are part of the aortic and pulmonary fibrous rings. These fibrous attachment sites are composed of thick, dense, fibrous connective tissue that extend to form the sheet-like cusps of the semilunar valves. Since the cusps are extensions of the three C-shaped or U-shaped fibrous attachment sites, they are both composed of dense fibrous connective tissue. Remember that the surfaces of all three cusps of both semilunar valves are lined with the endocardium. When the ventricles contract, the pressure generated by the contraction must be enough to push open these semilunar valves to eject or to pump blood from the ventricles into the arteries, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Take note how the right and left atrioventricular valves are closed when the ventricles contract. Now, when the ventricles relax, the blood in the arteries will attempt to re-enter the ventricles. The reason for this will be discussed later. This attempt fills the three cup-shaped cusps as blood pushes against these cusps. It is important that these three cusps meet when they fill with blood to close off the opening. Otherwise, we would have the backflow of blood from the arteries into the ventricles, which is referred to as regurgitation. When the aortic and pulmonary valves simultaneously close, the force and pressure they generate will produce another heart sound, the dub heart sound, which is heard when using a stethoscope. Take note how the right and left atrioventricular valves are open when the ventricles fully relax. As blood fills the atria during ventricular relaxation, the blood will eventually push open these AV valves and drain into the relaxed ventricles.